Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Thanks for coming to the session. My name is Jenny, and I will be your moderator today. A few quick reminders before we begin. Conference sessions are recorded and available on Hubalo through the end of October and on the CSHA website after that. Slides will be shared after the conference. Um, please feel free to enter any questions you may have for the Q&A session in the Q&A box. Um, we are collecting evaluations for each day. Links will be sent to you via email and also on the conference feed. Completing evaluations will be included in the raffle each day. So today we have Helen and Jeremy with us. Um, please welcome them. Thank you, Jenny. Um, I'm Helen Roth Dowden with uh, Teachers for Healthy Kids. And um, I'm here with Jeremy Ford today. And we're going to be talking about LEA BOC, uh, the Local Education Agency uh, Billing Option Program, and the new state plan expansion. Um, as some of you may know, as of July, the state um, extended the state plan and we're allowed to expand uh, the programs that cover uh, billing for services uh, within the school districts. And so these are for direct services. And um, what happened is there was an increase uh, both in the number of services that could be billed for uh, and the limits were taken off. Uh, new providers were uh, added and there was expansion also of the benefits. And one of the reasons that we're doing this today is to encourage all school districts to expand their LEA BOP program. And uh, we would welcome new districts that aren't um, already participating in this program. I think there are about um, 700 districts that participate in what's called the MA program, the State uh, Medi-Cal Administrative Activities Program and a little over 500 that are in the LEA bot for direct services. And in some cases, it may, may, not, may not make sense because the school district is small, but we're looking at ways where uh, uh, in other states, for example, they have uh, expanded services by uh, small rural districts getting together and providing services in coordination with each other. And we've seen this in Nevada, for example, and we think, for example, uh, because of the expansion of telemedicine uh, in California, this might be more of a possibility. So if you already have an expanded, we would like to talk to you about how you can make this possible. Um, what we will do today through our slides, and we should go to our next slide, is uh, we want to uh, understand um, what the changes are that are occurring. Um, what uh, non-IEP services to include in the care plans. And basically, we're trying to reimburse California, I think is 43rd in the nation, as the, uh, in terms of the amount that we bill for, it's really kind of pitiful. And um, our numbers have actually gone down uh, when other states have all gone up. So we've had some changes at the Department of Healthcare Services. We, with, uh, staff that's much more attuned to really helping schools. And we're really here to support what DHCS is doing. So also we want to encourage the Department of uh, Education to be more involved and to provide technical services um, because we really think this is an opportunity for California to draw in more federal dollars. And frankly, looking at what the budget is going to look like next year, that we are all gonna be in pretty sad shape until unless we figure out how we can provide um, more federal reimbursement for these programs. And we know all of you have been really going through a lot of angst and problems with all the changes with uh, remote learning and trying to figure out how you can make these programs work. We see this both as a danger and opportunity. We are starting this new program and we really wanna start it right. And so um, I'm here with Jeremy Ford, and uh, Jeremy is, um, is really an expert on this. He's with Oakland Unified uh, School District. He's a member of the Board of Teachers for Healthy Kids. And I should have said at the beginning that Teachers for Healthy Kids is a nonprofit that I run, and I'm Helen Roth Dowden who runs it, and that uh, Jeremy is on the Board of Teachers for Healthy Kids. He's also on the Board of Maine. Uh, which he can talk about as well, which is a, a, a nationwide organization 
of those working in with Medi-Cal programs or Medicaid programs in the school. And so with that, I will take and um, we can go to the next slide and um, we can start talking about the new services and uh, practitioners and um, some of the uh, implications of what this expansion means. So I'll turn it over and you have some of that. I, won't, I don't want to sort of read all this stuff off to you so you can really see what the implica implement implications are of uh, this expansion when only 12% of the kids have IEPs, but over 60% have Medi-Cal. The state plan amendment calls for expanding the LEA BOP program to be 60%. So this is gonna be a big jump in who is eligible for services and how they will be eligible for services. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jeremy, who's gonna talk about what you need to still have with a care plan and uh, what some of the other implications of this are. Jeremy? Yeah, thank you. Uh, one of the key parts of expansion is there's still some rules, some guidelines that allow schools, LEAs, to bill for these services. And that centers primarily around the care plan. So the state has, and I put kind of the definition there, defined the care plan as essentially any type of plan of care for the student. So things that are uh, like a school nurse office doing playground first aid, still not billable because there's no plan of care. Uh, so the expansion is still limited by, by certain rules, but those plans can be 504s. They can be uh, asthma action plans, uh, individual uh, school healthcare plans. And there's some examples here, but the idea is that this plan is what gives us the um, ability to build for it because we have structured the nature and extent of services that the student need and it gives it the medical necessity. So um, while it doesn't turn schools into a bill for everything, uh, it does allow us to bill for non it services uh, as long as we still have that structure in place to support the student's care. Jeremy, can you say who has to sign off on this plan? So, it, it, without getting too far into the details, because there are still other requirements, um, it's it's going to be the personnel for treating those students. So, we an additional requirement that is not part of this expansion um, still is the ordering, referring, and prescribing. So, for certain services, you still might need a physician to sign off or a licensed psychologist, it really depends, which is um, outside of this, but on the individual plan, it's going to be the team that's going to be implementing the services anyways, like the school nurse. In a lot of cases, that's what the 504s are built around, nursing services. So in that case, it would still be the school nurse. Um, additional orders and additional Medi-Cal requirements do still exist, um, but in terms of discussing this, um, change the care plan is what now is the expansion from the IEP. So there's still plenty of other requirements, but this this opens up from only the IEP structure to now any plan. And we will say that we're going to have uh, we try to leave time for um, for any questions. So if you have any questions on who needs to sign off on this plan, could it be a nurse practitioner, does it have to be a doctor, whatever it is, we're, we really wanna be able to answer these questions. So if you can take and put them in the chat, we'll be able to take a look at that. And um, Erica Barajas is here with us and she's gonna be checking that and helping us out with that. So as these go along, please um, just enter them. We may wait till the end, uh, but if there's something like really, you hey, wait a minute, go back, I really need to understand this. Uh, just let us know and we can try and answer it right away if that's gonna be more helpful to you. So uh, with that, do you wanna go on about random moments and tracking time? Um, well, so yeah, this is a slide referencing the new services and new practitioners. So we, this is really here for your reference. We, we don't need to read it, but essentially you can tell a lot of the new practitioners are assistants where before, like a speech language pathology assistant was not available. 
and then additional treatment, adding group to OT and PT, and then some of the new nutritional services. And one of the things that, uh, <clears throat> just talking on the associates that are listed under uh, psychology services, uh, the, uh, many of the school districts use these interns, and you're now going to be able to bill for the time for these interns, which we think are really important. And there are other projects that are afoot in the state, both with um, the Office of Statewide Health Planning and Development, with the Department of the Labor Agency, and with the, uh, some of the behavioral services boards uh, the department under the Department of Consumer Affairs of trying to figure out um, uh, how we can make more of these positions available, use them for clinical placements, and then also do supervision. So let's say you have a one psychologist at one school site to use telehealth to be able to supervise um, these interns that might be at different sites. So again, this is a really exciting time because we think we can build some really new kinds of modalities of treatments and uh, for services as we do this state plan amendment expansion. You know, and that's a really good point. If you look at this slide, you see the new practitioners, the associate MFTs and the associate uh, social workers, uh, but there are no new services associated with them. They actually can access the same services as the mental health practitioners that they're the associate of. So it really does right. expand it a lot by adding those, those new people. Right, so you can bill for all those services now that are provided by your interns. That's the important point here. So Jeremy, you wanna talk about, this is what the, um, we're gonna talk about the random moment time survey. Um, Many of you know this from the MA program. So now it's been moved over to the LEA Billing Option Program, which is gonna be a change. Um, we're gonna talk about some of the requirements. And let me give a little caveat. Because of COVID and the, um, there's something called um, the Public Health Emergency, PHE guidelines. And what this has meant is some of the things have been sort of thrown out the window that we have to meet. Originally, it was only go to October, 22nd, um, but the public health emergency has now been expanded to January 22nd. So that means that these rules are going to be um, in effect. One of them is uh, involved not meeting the 85% um, RMTS, where that's the number of uh, moments have to come back. Um, and the state is applying for a waiver for this. There have other been waivers. Also on the LEA BOP, the amount of reimbursement has gone up so that it's no longer 50-50 match, it's 56.2. So we do have an enhanced match during this period for services. So Jeremy, you wanna follow up? Yeah, so some of the requirements that are really built into this expansion, uh, right now are being waived, but we're still going to discuss them. I don't think it's great to get into a pattern of missing uh, these requirements, but when, the public health emergency is over and when these waivers are no longer in effect, some of these seemingly small issues can really uh, take your whole program. And on the next slide, I'll go into a little bit more detail. Specifically around, there's a lot of information on here, but meeting that 85% uh, before, when you were just doing SMOM, meant potentially you would be suspended for a quarter and not able to turn in an ESMA invoice for that associated quarter. And if you, you know, failed to meet it twice, then there was an additional punishment. Uh, what we have to know now, and is so important, is with the integration of what, what we call um, the time survey pool one, which are all of the direct service providers, not meeting the 85% in that pool actually means not only do you miss out on that mom money, whatever amount that is, but that entire quarter now for the direct service for the LEA Bob, you are not able to bill. And if you do bill, submit claims, because they will still pay those claims, when you go to reconcile the cost on the CRCS, which we're gonna talk about a little bit more too, um, when you go to reconcile that cost, you'll have to pay back that money. So uh, that will be a, big shock to people.
people that maybe you're at 84 um, percent you know so every moment now and under rmts it is really the driving force of this program that's just the requirement then when we get to kind of the bottom bullet point about what code 2a is um, I actually have an equation later on to get into the nitty gritty, but essentially it is, it is vitally important that when staff answer the moment, they answer it so clearly that coders are able to code it to code 2A because 100% of your money on the CRCS will be based on this percentage. So if, if you, through your responses, say, only 10% of my time is spent on billable services, then you're only going to get 10% of that money back. And if you say 90%, then 90%, right? There's, there's some realistic percentage that we're gonna have to figure out that by the end of this year, we'll, we'll have an answer to that. But this, this is completely new for schools. And it used to only be, I saw a student, I submit a claim, and it'll all kind of reconcile in the end. But now, is I saw a student, I submitted a claim, and I answered my moment. And obviously, we want to answer the moments accurately, but the example here is sometimes accuracy is not a matter of making something up or being fraudulent. It's just being very clear about what you're doing. Something non-billable actually is billable only because you're actually more clear about it. And there's an example that, that Jeremy has listed here. Uh, uh, how you would answer. And I know um, the department is trying to do some stuff on, on this as well. They had a, a bit of a confusing uh, call yesterday, but they really are trying to put this together with giving you some ideas of how to clearly answer so it shows what you're doing is related to direct health services because on the Ma side, it, that's not what it has to be uh, related to. It can be access, it can be outreach, but this has to be talking about within your direct services, which are health services uh, that a student is receiving. Right, and yeah, and this example is a real example pulled from a previous year. And in that previous year, it didn't matter. There was no calculation associated with it. But now, this actually, an incorrect wording here can actually impact every single other LEA in the universe. That's kind of a, it's a larger concept, but in the RMTS pools, we're with other school districts. So your actions affect them positively and negatively, much like their actions for you. So that's a part of what we're doing is, is telling all schools, hey, this is really important. Because if one screws up, it's going to really um, impact how everybody else gets reimbursed. Because it used to be you were under a much smaller group, but now whether you're in a, mainly a left, there are some LGAs left, um, then it's it's more difficult. So this is really, um, um, and I know there may be some people that are school clinic people, so you're probably thinking, what the hell is this world RMTS mean, and what right. are you guys talking about with LEX and LGAs? So maybe we should go back and be a little clearer about this. So Jeremy, you want to talk about what a lot, what an LGA is, what a TSP is, what a you know, like just let's do a, yeah. let's move back a little bit if this is an issue. Sure. Yeah, I, I definitely understand that the way I talk because this is my whole world. I just go through these topics. But so RMTS is the Random Moment Time Study or Survey. I've seen it both, um, and it's unique. Uh, well, it's not unique to other schools, but our version is unique to the school-based LEA billing program. So LEA billing in general is a carve-out from other programs. So we might, as Oakland Unified, for example, we might have clinics that our students go to and they bill Medi-Cal. We might have a children's hospital that our student goes to and they might bill Medi-Cal. And this student might go to a county and they bill Medi-Cal, and all of these programs are separate from our program, which is why we have certain rules that are being expanded here. And part of our program and taking care of that student is 
we also are required to participate in the random moment time study. Um, and it's literally random moments. We get hundreds of these where a, an individual once identified as belonging to this pool, my example is of one of our speech therapists. Do you want to say what a TSP is? A, a time survey participant. So this time survey participant, a speech therapist, will get an email and say, hey, Tuesday, October 8th at 12.50 p.m., what were you doing? And, and that's the answer they need to answer. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated. There's five questions, but you, you don't have to go into that level of detail. But um, what we have to do is, is really uh, answer, answer those moments accurately and honestly, but the other agencies that we participate in don't do RMTS. Uh, they have all their own rules and systems. So that's why um, RMTS, it's unique in our program to the LEA billing option. Time survey participants, pool one are the direct service providers, pool twos are the admins who, administrators, they could be principals or coordinators who connect students to health services but don't do direct services. So there's a question about why you don't use EPSCT. Well, part of it is historical in California and that frankly, EPSCT is the federal name for early periodic screening, diagnos diagnosis and treatment, I think that's it, which are basically Medi-Cal services for kids. And so this is a whole big array. And in other states, which makes total sense to me, basically, whether you're in a school or you're a county or whoever, you can then bill for any service that's an EPSDT service. And what happened in California um, is that it, when um, there was a court case and it was ruled that the, basically the, the schools in, um, had to provide services for kids, and I think it was around disability rights group, um, and the state decided, oh my gosh, this is going to bankrupt us. So what we'll do is we'll put the counties over this, and then we'll have the schools have these sub-programs, and they bifur bifurcated it basically to really save money, I think. And there's been a move afoot lately to say, why, why should the place where you're actually providing the services determine what those services are? Why do you need these TSPs, these people that are spelled out as a service provider? If you're a provider under Medi-Cal, you should just be a provider under Medi-Cal. So right now, the state is looking at this whole issue and these very complicated programs under something called SB 75, which if you're a member of uh, Teachers for Healthy Kids, and you can take and send us your name if you're on here and you wanna be on our list, um, a new report came out, which is ways that we're looking at redesigning their systems in California. So we're taking a look at how this health plan or how this new change, the state plan amendment, which just went into effect in July, that actually goes back five years ago. It was actually 2015 when we weren't thinking of some of these big issues. And other states, when they've done their state plan amendment, they just make it for all EPSDT eligible services, and the school is just a place where they're delivered. There's no big bifurcation. That's not the way it works in California. And uh, primarily that's because the state wanted to tamp down the cost on this, and they thought it was going to be too expensive if they allowed the schools just to pay uh, to bill uh, for this directly. So it's partly history that's caused the situation now, and um, I think all everyone is starting to look at this and realize: Do we have the same the same system, the system that we need? But right now, we know because of the system that we have, we're only like we're forty third out of fifty states. So we've got, we, can, we know that we can do better under these changes that came out in July. And once we think we get people to do better under this, it's not a totally rational system, we think that's going to put us in a better place if there are further changes that can be made. But that means having the counties give up some of their oversight. And, you know, for those of us who's been struggling around this for a long time, that's not as easily said is done and we know that in California we don't have 
with California Department of Education. In other states, the Department of Education has been a very strong advocate for school-based programs. We don't even have an Office of School Health here in California within the, our Department of Education. So the schools have really been sort of at a, um, at a disadvantage with DHCS. We have seen though that things are starting to change and there is more uh, collaboration. Um, but I'm getting sort of off the point, so we'll go yeah. back to Jeremy, who's now gonna get you back into the nitty gritty of what the RMTS participation pools look like. Um, with that, and we'll start with full one. One, one add-on to that though, because it is, it is an important question. Um, why do we do these programs? Going forward with these changes that some of us have been working on since 2015, um, when we compare ourselves to other states, we see that these changes, specifically the way that right. cost calculations are done and expansion, do result in more dollars. So significant, though. significant, and and we can't really make any predictions um, on what that'll look like for any individual district at this point. We will by the end of the year, um, but it actually could be possible that this program will be better in some scenarios than billing straight Medi-Cal right. or EPSDT. So there's actually a lot of growth potential here if we do it correctly, which is kind of what this is about. Right, because other states actually, um, the, they've decided other counties that it just made a lot more sense for them to do it this way than actually do it through. It, it depends on county size and a lot of other things about whether EPSDT is the best way to go um, because it, it requires school districts to put their money up in most of the cases. And I don't know whether the school districts are all that willing to give their money to the counties. So those are other kinds of consideration. It's not all a, yeah. you know, it doesn't always work. There's no super easy Medi-Cal program. Right. That we just didn't, didn't hit on. <laughs> okay, so let's go on. Okay. To the so there's uh, several questions about uh, plans. And I kind of want to save that all for the end. They're really good questions. Um, so I think we can answer them all kind of at the same time. Uh, okay, so in terms of what's so important now is getting your people in participant pool one. These are your direct service providers. And so I, I put it very clearly here, you must include them if they're employed and you plan on billing for them. Um, and the reason why is if you don't, as of right now, the rules stand, if you forget somebody, they start too late for you to add them, whatever, when it comes time to do your CRCS, which is the cost reconciliation comparison schedule, I always get that name mixed up, but it's it's comparing your cost to what you build. When you, when you fill that out, if you miss somebody on pool one, you cannot put their cost on there, which means essentially you're not billing for that person. So you may be submitting interim claims and getting paid for their therapies, but if you didn't put them on pool one, then ultimately you can't claim those dollars and you would have to pay back those individual claims. Now it still might settle where you're positive, but it's important that you do that. Now the big exception, which has tripped a lot of people up, and is, and is rather confusing is contractors and contracted practitioners are not included on the RMTS at all. They're actually excluded specifically. Uh, and the reason for this, and we show you the math later, which is exciting, I think it's exciting. Um, they're put directly on the cost um, side of the CRCS, meaning in a way you get kind of full credit for them. So that's, uh, if you have employed staff, employees, they absolutely must go on pool one if you plan on doing any billing for them or getting any reimbursement for them. If they're contractors, they absolutely cannot go on RMTS pool one or pool two. If you did for some reason put them in pool two, then it eliminates them from the CRCS. So a lot of people, that might generate some questions. That one, that one has been. I think the state has 
had to mention that in every training because it is a big shift. Okay, we'll go to the next one. So this is uh, this next slide is more of a reference. So looking at how all the new practitioners fit in. Uh, these are all the staff that are pool one. If you have these staff and plan on billing for them and they meet the licensing requirements and all that, then they absolutely must go to pool one um, if, if you want to bill for them. Maybe it's just a second to look at that. All right. And then these slides will all be available. Um, right. The recording of the slides are available, so I, I don't want to go through all of that. And, and we have some resources at the end that will link you to uh, those as well. So pool two, just to separate it from pool one, um, this whole presentation is mostly about pool one, but I wanted to just clarify what, what goes into pool two. These are the staff that are traditionally doing ESMA. Uh, so these staff will not go on the CRCS. The CRCS is the cost reconciliation comparison schedule. The CRCS, uh, there's a whole slide next, um, but, but essentially these staff exist only in the ESMA program. If you're a school district, you have a LEC or an LGA that you contract with. Um, they, they submit the ESMA invoices for the state. This is work like um, referring students for services, assisting them sign up for Medi-Cal, uh, coordinating their services, not direct service providers. On the previous slide with the list of direct service providers, those are not pool two people unless for some reason they're not actively billing. My example is a school psychologist who only does the gifted and talented assessments, educational assessments. So they do not do any direct services. They don't do any IEP assessments. They don't do anything related to psychology. Okay. So, uh, next slide. Okay, so the CRCS, Cost Re Reimbursement Comparison Schedule. Um, this is one of those often overlooked program requirements. It's not overlooked because people don't do it, but people don't necessarily, uh, I don't want to say maximize it, but really understand the implications of prior decisions. You fill this out a year after you have done these services. So that's why it's so important to get that pool one correctly get those people in your pool one because now you can put their salaries and benefits on here. And the major change, I could probably talk for an hour just about the CRCS, obviously I will not, um, but the major change is all the equations about how many hours it calculated that your staff saw students, that's all being replaced by that RMTS code 2A. Again, that's why those answers are so important because a major component of the CRCS is being completely rewritten. There's essentially only two factors. There's your cost, which you have control over based on what you pay your staff and who you choose to include. That's your cost. And then there's the time. That's your responses to code 2A, and it's everybody else's responses too. So your cost and your time, and that's really all you have to say over. So there's some more to the equation which we'll talk about, but but that's um, that's really it. So this change, when you actually look at the math behind it, is is a huge change. And this is also where I note the contractor cost pass through. That's not affected by Code Two A because they're not part of that pool. And then what Helen mentioned earlier is the backcasting going all the way back to fifteen sixteen. In, in, in our basic estimations, which we don't have the final numbers for yet, it will likely mean more money for schools. Um, so that's great. Uh, obviously that's great and, and I can't make any individual promises, but when we compare to other states that have gone through this same transition 10 years ago, um, we saw the same thing. This reimbursement increase. This is why we're so far down. So potentially backcasting, which means recalculating those old uh, CRCS and forms, really could mean uh, quite a bit of money. And we're, we're now talking to the department because we're worried about which order they're gonna be using. 
and particularly with COVID and how this may impact what goes back to the other quarters. So this is, I know the back assing word is like, people really want to run out the doors when we mention back assing. But this actually could be um, very helpful. Um, there is a question about what sort of documentation is needed for the back casting because people don't want to do this and then get audited and then lose all their money back. So yeah. these are still open questions that we need to work really closely with the department on because it could, this could be worth hundreds of millions of dollars for the schools or not, right. uh, depending on how we do this. Yeah, and depending on your individual decisions, what can I include, what can I not include? Retroactive allowances are also for the expanded services. So, oh yeah, we hired that speech assistant three years ago. Should I put them on the back casting? These are really questions that are gonna be answered over the next couple of months. We, we're all working very closely with the department to get these guidelines. Um, you know, and, and I see, even if you were to take a conservative approach to back testing, we're still looking at it dollars for most LEAs. So that's, I mean, any way you look at it, that's good. All right, so on the next slide, here's some math. Um, I try not to include uh, too much. This is like, you know, this is what I get really excited about. But people ask all the time, I, I've gotten this question 30, 40 times, one-on-one, -on -one, in groups, everywhere. Why can't we put the contractors on? What does that mean? And I keep telling people, Relaxed, it's actually a good thing. And here's why it's a good thing. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna literally go top to bottom. Let's say $100,000 is the cost of employees, salaries and benefits. That is then discounted by code 2 a We have no idea what that number is going to be. I did 30 to 40% because nationally that's, would cover how most states are. MER is a Medi-Cal eligibility rate. I put 50% because that makes math easy. So if you look at the equation, then you have your 100,000, that's your cost, discounted by code 2A, you did 30%, discounted by medical eligibility rate, or discounted by the federal matching uh, portion, which as Helen mentioned out earlier, we are on a temporary increase. That's also only benefit to us. Uh, an additional six, 56 .2. an additional 6.2 percent that's not counted in here just just so you can get a basic because that's not going to be always there um so your hundred thousand dollar employee turns into seven thousand five hundred dollars of reimbursement that might seem like a lot that might seem like very little to you um what i can say is if you were to and if you ever want to send me your old crcs's feel free to email them to me but if you actually do the math for most schools, honestly, every school I've ever looked at, that's actually the increase. But that's on 30%. What if it's 40%? What if it's 50%? And that goes back to training people, getting them to be very clear about their answers, very clear about their responses, right? Do you think that your staff is only spending 30% of the time doing direct services, writing reports, supporting those direct services, coordinating those uh, direct services, it's going to be a bigger number than 30% in, in my experience, but we'll see how the dollars pan out. And then if we look on the contractor side, well, Jeremy, what about the contractors, right? Not discounted by code 2A. So the rest of the equation is the same, but there's not that additional discount. So your in this case, that $100,000 contractor, your total reimbursement is $25,000. That's a big change to this equation. And, and part of the reason for this is there is really, I think, a prejudice at CMS that people who work in schools don't just do direct health services. It's not like they work at clinics. They work on education problems. So the discount is for everything that they consider education related rather than health related because they don't want to pay for education related services. So the way to think about this is if you have people that are just, you know, what percentage of their time is for health services and they would discount, for example, if you have a counselor and in their, they're working in a high school as psychologists, they may be helping people with what are you going to do to get into college? 
But however, if you have that same person, a psychologist working at the elementary level, it's going to be a lot more than 30% because most of their things are how do you take in what are the um, what are the problems that are causing this kid not to be able to learn? And those should be psychologically related services. So those are the kinds of differences. And so when you look at, at people filling out their forms, they should really think about what am I doing that's health related? Because that's sort of the nub of this whole thing because CMS doesn't wanna pay for things that they consider are being paid for out of education dollars. Yeah, in one of the samples, because now we have real-time access, one of the samples that I saw was we're in a staff meeting discussing when school is going to reopen. Okay, that's that's not O2A. But every other person that has answered so far has been a O2A answer. And that's really encouraging because this number right here, this map, is really relying on that. And I think it's also realistic uh, that people spend a lot of the so, and the reason that on the contractor, they figure, okay, you're paying for this person at, uh, you know, a per hour. So obviously they're going to come in and just do the services. So that's why you don't see the discount on the other, the other side. The yeah. MER may also be low um, in this calculation, but this is just to give you an idea about what this looks like for you. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so next slide then. Okay, so there's still a lot we don't know. And one of the things we mentioned right off the top is what waivers are going to impact what rules and what deadlines and what quarters are they going to use? What will be the result of code 2A? As I mentioned on the previous slide, we used 30%, but you can do the math. It's, it's all right there. What if that was 50%? What does that mean for dollars? Um, we don't know. TCM and transportation, it's the first time they're going to be added to the CRCS. They've been outside of cost reconciliation. They've been outside of those audits, which is our primary way we're audited. There's other ways to be audited, but that's the primary way is they audit the CRCS. So if you're planning on billing TCM and transportation, are you meeting all the rules? Um, TCM is a very complicated program that I think often people don't understand how complicated it actually is. We've had guidance from um, the IEP of special education in CDE basically saying the TCM that they've found in IEPs doesn't really stand up to um, the requirements and meet the IEP. I'm not saying you're doing TCM right or wrong. I'm saying this is the first time we're going to be scrutinized and audited on, so just double check that you're doing what you need to do there. And, and we're, trying to, um, we're trying to work more with audits and investigations with SPHCS to figure out what are you going to look at when you go in an audit. So we have a request. Our next meeting is going to be October 29th. And we have invited audits and investigations to come and talk to us. I don't know whether they'll say yes, but we are trying to get them to do a little prophylactic here and uh, figure out exactly what they're going to be looking at so people don't get caught with uh, not understanding what the rules are. Yeah, for sure. And, and that's, we, we don't want to celebrate the expansion and celebrate all of our, our new uh, money and then have to pay it all back. <laughs> um, I think you've kind of mentioned some of the things. What will the CRCS look like? We have a team of schools and DHCS already discussing that. So. And it's supposed to be available this week. We were told yesterday that it's, they're looking at the CS, uh, uh, posting it um, by the end of the week. So uh, hopefully we'll have that and we can look, do a little analysis and then use the Teachers for Healthy Kids to have really kind of study sessions on how it is that you fill it out. So we're hoping to be doing this as part of this year with Teachers for Healthy Kids with our regular So these are other resources. These are things the state, you know, we had problems with the state just not holding sessions where they were um, uh, letting people know about things. And I think they've gotten a lot better with the training. So if you're not, um, if, if you're not uh, uh, involved yet, 
in these slides, the slides that we're talking about are the ones that are the list of providers and new services. And then if you want to sign up for their mailing list, which will give you all the uh, letters that are coming out on this, what we call the PPLs, um, that uh, you'll be able to be notified as those come up with, because there are going to be uh, lots of changes in the program in the next, um, uh, next couple of months. So I know we had some questions and we wanted to leave time for questions. So we also put in this last, if you want to be on our mailing list, there's the mailing list um, uh, to subscribe to Teachers for Healthy Kids. We have, I don't know, over 225 um, school districts, educational institutions that are already part of this group. Uh, we're always wanting to expand um, and uh, we're also part of a federal group uh, and uh, we work with Jeremy and Maine uh, to try and get as much information to you, uh, both from within the state and then what's happening at the federal level. So with that, I know we have questions and um, if we can put the, we'll put the questions up on the board that are in the chat. If you haven't asked a question already, feel free to just type it into the chat and um, it'll come up. So with that, let's go through. Can we go back to the resources? Slide. Okay, so we're going to go back to resources. For I kind of want to mention, so the training specifically, and this will kind of answer several of the questions that we saw, oh, probably not to your satisfaction. Um, so several of the trainings recently will be posted here. The last time I put this link yesterday, it wasn't up, but they did mention in the meeting, uh, the, the LEA work group meeting yesterday, that if you were on the mailing list, then known about. Um, they did mention that meeting yesterday that this website, the training website, is going to be where they're putting um, all of this information. It's going to be very clearly marked, easy to understand. Uh, I'm excited to see that. That's something that the state struggled with for years. So I saw probably seven at least questions about the care plan. Does this count? Does that count? Um, I don't have those answers. Uh, the state is going to be uh, posting their training. They did a training on that. So I can, I can give you the short version, which is um, not to be taken as a comprehensive answer, uh, though, because it is very important that uh, you're right about this. But the purpose of a care plan is to outline the student's needs, their goals, very similar to what, what you get in an IEP. Uh, their needs, uh, the goals, and um, also, you know, what their treatment's going to be, uh, who's supporting this. So when you say something like, uh, like, does an asthma action plan count because that student is getting medication? Well, it probably does, right? Um, what I would say is look at their definition of a care plan when it's posted. And if you want to send me an email, I also have the trainings because I've saved them and I could try to answer you a little better, but I don't want to, without looking at a care plan, it's hard for me to say, yes, this counts. So the question is, are you meeting the requirements? And we honestly, we could have done a whole hour just on care plans. So that's why that part was a little, a little vague because, you know, are you, do you have a plan to meet the needs of the students and what services will you be performing and who will be performing them? Um, that's, that's generally what you're looking for. That's, it's, it's the same as IEPs though. There's no guarantee that just because you've done an IEP that now you've met the requirement for an IEP, right? There's still a lot uh, to that. Okay, were there other, other questions outside of Okay, let's see. Care plans. Um, can you bill individual counseling under a care plan for a student with an IEP for speech and language only? Uh, so if you have in, so the question is, yeah, it, so can you bill counseling if the student has an IEP for speech and language only? It, 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 you got, yes, as long as the counseling is covered under that care plan, it meets all the requirements for care plans. So, so it's not mutually exclusive. Uh, you will bill the speech therapy for IEP and you will bill the non-IEP counseling services. But there's no, uh, there's no requirement that they overlap as 
as long as you meet the requirements for it. Like everyone. But remember, with the expansion, you don't need an IEP. Any kid who is Medi-Cal eligible is able, and you're able also, even whether a kid has Medi-Cal or not, when you're doing a service, it's not depending on whether the kid has Medi-Cal. It's just on whether you're providing that services in the school setting. But you do need to figure, and that's what the Medi-Cal percentage number is, which is it tells, okay, I'm providing 100 services, but I only have 60% of the kids who are on Medi-Cal. So then they, they reduce it by the number to realize, well, 60% of those kids probably have Medi-Cal. It may be that 80% of the kids you're providing services for actually have Medi-Cal. But the other part of this is to get your Medi-Cal percentage up. And what we have been working on at Teachers for Healthy Kids is to try and make sure that these kids remain under coverage because your Medi-Cal percentage is gonna become really, really important as this goes forward. And we know more kids are being eligible for Medi-Cal. We know that we have about 90 some percent of the kids who are eligible for Medi-Cal are now covered by it, which is really great. We have seen that number has gone down though because people are worried to sign up for Medi-Cal because of all the immigration stuff that's happened with the Trump administration. We're hoping that's gonna change, but that definitely um, people are worry about, worried about using uh, care, uh, but they often are open to getting that care through the schools because they know the schools won't report them. But we actually have a way, we have this tool called Chipper, and you can contact us, which is you can match your Medi-Cal, the people who are on Medi-Cal, with those who have recently fallen off within the last year, and you can find out whether those kids are actually enrolled or not to give you an idea about who on the Ma side you need to reach out to those families. The one thing about under COVID is the counties since March have not been doing redeterminations. So all those families that were eligible as of March, usually they fall up because, off because the families don't do the redetermination. That isn't happening so much anymore. So these kids are probably still maintaining their eligibility unless they're new into your district. And lots of districts have seen churn. So um, they may have fallen off for that reason. Otherwise, if you want to help with making sure that you're getting the most, the highest number of Medi-Cal and capturing all those kids, contact us and we can help you with that. Uh, another question, how difficult is it to get set up using mental health individuals to provide therapy? Uh, that is a multi-pronged answer. So if, if you're not involved in this program at all, getting started from zero, it, it's a lot of work because you have to become an LEA biller, which is a contract with the state. You have to then get a contract with the LEC or LDA to do RMTS. Uh, so it's, it's a lot. If you already have someone and you want to bring in more counselors, more mental health individuals, kind of what that sounds like to me, then it's, um, there is the, uh, the ORP that we were talking about before. Who can sign off on services? Physicians, nurse practitioners, uh, physician assistants, they can sign off on the uh, ordering, referring, and prescribing requirement through Medi-Cal. And for mental health services, so can licensed clinical social workers, but you have to sign up through Medi-Cal. And one of my providers just did this, um, has not been approved yet, but went through the sign-up process, and it was not so bad, I mean, for Medi-Cal. Yeah, they have really changed it because, yeah. because of COVID, and they realize there's a need for more practitioners. They have really streamlined some of these sign-up, so particularly with using telehealth. So we have been working with the California Association of School Psychologists, and we're trying to put together some training sessions, for example, to help school psychologists to use telehealth so they can actually provide these services to uh, families. So it has gotten easier. Again, if you need help, call us or, or send us an email, and we will see what we can do to help you um, to, to make this an easier process for you. Yeah, and I feel like, for those of us, those of the people watching that don't know us, this it's not a sales pitch. <laughs> we're we're, we're we don't funded charge by, anything. Right, we're funded by a foundation. 
Yeah, so, and so yeah. it's free. We're not asking. We're not. You're not paying. When we say we'll help you set it up, we're not taking a percentage. <laughs> right, right. We right. just, we're we just help people. Yeah. So this is paid for at California Healthcare Foundation. We first we, Teachers for Healthy Kids was started by the California Endowment. So um, over time, and the health plans also provide funding for this. Yeah. So these are these are the kinds of things, and we're just here to assist. We're a small nonprofit, and we're just here to assist you and um, to direct you to those people that can help. Right, and Oakland Unified is very supportive of my time and allowing me to help other LEAs get these programs working and help teach for healthy kids. So greatly. Peer to peer support, that. I think. Peer to peer support, yeah. So any. Are there other questions? Let me see. I think you want to go back up because I think we missed a couple of questions in the front. A lot about the plans, yeah. So, what is CRCS? Okay, that's just, and that's the new form that's going to be available, and um, you need to take a look at that. And these other care plans, um, this is good because I think we can relay back to the department that people are really interested in yeah. what a care plan is. That's so really this helps us to tell them. There's also the department is putting together a TSP committee and um, who should be on, you know, there was some talk, for example, special education teachers aren't going to be one of the people that you're allowed to bill for. And so, because they feel they don't spend more than 50% of their time on medical services. So we think that uh, this committee that's being put together by DHCS, that we wanna make sure that real school practitioners participate in these committees so that the, so that they, they, we can, they can actually hear, the state can hear from you uh, specifically. You know, we've been talking about, for example, why is it that you don't wanna use to do back casting this quarter? Well, you talk to school psychologists and they say, we can't do any assessments because they have to be in person. Or even if we try and do them over telehealth, we use manipulatives and you can't do a manipulative when, it, when a kid doesn't have it in front of them, so that doesn't work. And the Department of Health Services, they don't understand these kinds of limitations that happen in the school environment. That's why we need you involved. So that's the other pitch that we're going to make uh, to helping. So um, there's another question. Uh, yeah, I know we have a question. couple more. Uh, what documentation system do you recommend for supporting employee salaries? So every year they will audit the CRCS to various levels. And so they are going to want to see some type of report. So what type of report does your fiscal system have? I have talked to a few other schools, mostly charters, who don't use the SACS, the standard accounting code structure. Um, and that is a lot uh, more difficult. So I guess, I guess the short answer is general payroll salary and benefits reports out of your um, HR and fiscal will, will be enough 99% of the time. If you don't use a standard accounting structure because they're going to want to see object codes, they're going to want to see uh, resource codes to make sure they're not paid out of federally, then it really comes down to the best documentation you can provide to prove that that person was paid. I've only really seen that be a problem with charter schools though, which is, is it uh, a pay stuff? Is it, you know, a, a separate report out of quick in? I have seen all kinds of different examples, but uh, there's no shortage of documentation. You can't, you can't give them too much. Um, but if you're an LEA and you use a system based out of SACS, you're going to be fine, uh, as long as it has resource object and function code names, things like that. So we're, we're getting right towards the end here. So um, I wanted to just uh, thank everybody for attending. Jeremy doing such a great job for Erica helping us, and for Jenny uh, who's over at uh, with the um, with the School Health Association. And we're really excited to be here with you today. And if you have any questions, please feel free to contact us. And um, with that, Jeremy, you have any final words? It's it, sign up for the mailing list for the state. Teacher Healthy Kids, there's a lot of information constantly changing, constantly going. You can't, you can't know it all, but we can try to represent.
work me too. Okay, friends. Thanks everyone for attending today. We really appreciate it. Take care. Have a great rest of the day.